your main man returns today with a special guest host. That's right. Today, I'm going to be putting the questions to Mr. Brown, Martin Brown of Grognard Games. I call him Groggy. I call him Nards. I call him whatever the hell I want to, but he's here, and I'm going to ask him a question, a question that has been... Uh, been around quite a bit and check out Grognard's games go subscribe to him if you haven't already I don't know why because he's been on my recommended pages right at the top for a long time you need to check his videos out he is a real proponent uh, of immersive gaming a real proponent of making your game uh, really pop and and bringing uh, historical elements he's got a wonderful series uh, of the history of Dungeons and Dragons wonderful series on using uh, the scenery in, in the game correctly and, and to a, uh, a greater degree of reality. Check all that out. Uh, subscribe to him. His videos are absolutely wonderful. And you know I don't come on here and say that if it ain't the case. So make sure you do that. But today we're going to talk about did Dungeons and Dragons come from Chainmail? Now probably anyone out there who's been around Dungeons and Dragons for some period of time has heard <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons Chainmail and then the sound of your main man smack us Um. Now, but you, you, we hear that. Dungeons & Dragons came from a war game. Dungeons & Dragons is a war gaming vehicle. It's only right that Dungeons & Dragons is played with miniatures, so they don't seem to appear in the early editions. But that doesn't really matter, because Dungeons & Dragons has uh, solidly grabbed in 4th edition, this, and even in 3rd edition, this heavy uh, placement on the map, heavy... Uh, buy loads of miniatures. you got to have a zombie army, a kobold army, beholders. It looks like you're fucking playing Warhammer Fantasy. Uh, so, the, the game itself, uh, you get people that, that will come on there when your main man talks about bringing those immersive aspects to Dungeons and Dragons. When I talk about the responsibility of Wizards of the Coast, the responsibility of Dungeons and Dragons writers to make it a role-playing game, to make it a game that facilitates immersion. To me, that is what role-playing game means. It means assuming the role and being able to look out through the eyes of, of the character. Outside of that, I think the other definitions are weak and need to be stricken from all uh, dictionaries. So, it's about that immersive aspect in play. I want to talk about the original Dungeons and Dragons here. I want to talk about the origins, and I want to put this to you out there who are naysayers who do not believe in such things and who wish to cite at other information. Uh, so, uh, to you, Mr. Brown, did Dungeons and Dragons come from Chainmail? No, no, it did not. Um, this box here, this is the original. Dungeons and Dragons, printed in 1974, three volume set. Um, it was later uh, reprinted. There was a thousand copies of that uh, printed. Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson and Rob Koontz, um, a couple of other people, Dave Bloom, they would hand make these games, box them up. They would, uh, if you can see this on the camera, this is a sticker that stuck on, that was hand stuck on by one of these guys, as was the front. Um, and then they would be mail ordered out and uh, sold. Within about a year the first print run was exhausted, then they did the second print run of 2000 and then it changed into a white box and the cover changed very slightly from this, well, actually massively from this cover to this cover which was the white box version. Um, there are numerous references to Chainmail actually um, throughout the box but that doesn't mean that the game came from Chainmail in any way shape or form. Um, what happened was that in the original role-playing that, that occurred back then, there was a game called Braunstein, uh, which is run by a, game, a guy called David Wesley, and Dave Arneson was a part of that gaming group. Um, and they would take on a role of a postmaster or a general or something, and this was a war game. And what they would do is they would role-play out the, the part of the general in a very, very limited way. They would have a bit of dialogue and a conversation. It was the most basic version of role playing as you could ever possibly imagine. And Dave Arneson decided that he would actually take that little bit and he created a small campaign called Blackmoor uh, and he would send his players down in there. Now uh, I did an interview with Robert Koontz on this and uh, Rob was one of the absolute original playtesters. He's one of the very very last living people that was at Gary's table all the way through the entire from day one Dungeons and Dragons development process. He was there from day one, from beginning to the end, to the publication of the box set and further on, even to the point where he wrote, or I have the book here, here we go, 
uh, Greyhawk, Gygax and Koontz, and the other way. Uh, actually, Rob wrote most of this, if not all of it, and uh, Gary stamped his name on it. Um, so, essentially, if you go to 13 minutes and 10 seconds of that interview, and Andrew, what I'll do, if you don't mind, is I'll post that interview as a video response to this Please so people do. can track it Everyone check away. that interview out. I, I started watching it, and I said, oh, I'll just get in for a few minutes, watch the entire thing in one sitting. It's a great interview. It really is. Well, Rob says at 13 minutes and 10 seconds, no. Chainmail did not in any way, shape, or form form a part of the playtests. Uh, and Gary Gygax, essentially, the alternative rules, there's two sets of combat rules listed in uh, the D&D original box. There's an alternative rule system, and there's a reference to Chainmail, that you could use the Chainmail rules if you really wanted to. Uh, and Gary always played with his own version of the alternative rules. So even the version that Gary played with is not actually strictly the one that's in this box. Um, and the reason why there are references to Chainmail in the D&D box set is business. Uh, and it is nothing more than business. So what I'm going to tell everybody, the whole world now who's watching this, is that Gary made a very distinct business decision to go, okay, I have a game called Chainmail. It's got a combat system in it. I'm going to try and appeal to the people who I have already sold to with my new game because I want it to be a success. That was the decision. So there are references to Chainmail purely because there was a pre-existing market that was aware of Gidon Games and TSR, and they wanted to market to those people, make the rules familiar so the transition would be easy, but those are not the rules that were ever used during the playtest. They're never the rules that Gary Gygax ever played with, uh, according to the people that were there. Um, and the entire experience, the original experience with D&D, &D was purely about creativity, springboarded imagination, taking something to the most immense boundary as possible. This is the first time this had ever been done. Uh, so people were trying to stretch the boundaries of every element of the game as far as they could. Uh, and it's, it has left us with a few strange legacy things like dungeons that make no sense. I don't think there's ever been an entire historical anything that said that oh there's 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 a massive dungeon beneath this this small hut in the woods uh, or a castle or a cathedral it, it, it's it's nonsense and it seems to have pervaded the game ever since but graph paper easy to draw on corridors you know and you can see why in the early days certain things did come out the way that they did but to answer the question very succinctly uh, no it did not come from chainmail. And things like where I see people on online forums uh, and other videos going, well, D&D &D was descended from war games, so 4E is very close to the original version of D&D. &D. No, it's not. It's not in any way, shape, or form Dungeons and Dragons as it was originally envisaged. Um, you didn't need miniatures. You didn't need a grid. It was completely optional. Gary said, if you want miniatures, play as long as there's a spectacle. Uh, and by spectacle, in Gary's world, being a war gamer himself, that was a massive table full of miniatures. That was a spectacle. Um, but no, I don't know what else you want to ask on that one, but uh, that is a myth, and it has unfortunately been a myth. It's pervaded role-playing games for so long that when some people create a game, they look at the mechanics first, imagination second. With those guys, it was absolutely only about the imagination. The rules came second, and actually you can see that when you look at the rules, that the rules came second, because um, they were only about creativity and innovation. Um, and they were talking about, okay, they had some uh, methods of determining probability. They would determine probability on the fly with completely improvised rules that simply never made it into the box set. When I last spoke to, actually, one, one of the first conversations I ever had with Rob Coons, he was talking about this. This isn't even the version of the game of D&D &D that they were playing throughout the playtest when they were creating the game. They still never played with the rules as are written in this because it was about taking, to quote... Um, one guy who wrote Swords and Wizards 3, I think it was him, um, you know, just just take something and imagine the hell out of it. And that's exactly what they were doing from day one. I think it's very interesting, Martin, that you talk about uh, imagination first. And I get comments like that, too. Of course, I often rail against the 4E, I rail against the miniatures, the battle grids. And uh, we, we will be having a, a special video celebrating battle grids and my feelings on them coming out uh, <laughs> not too long from now. I have some battle grids here in my captivity, and uh, you'll be waiting for that one. But the fact that you talk about imagination 
over mechanics. I get so many people that so often look at these rules, these rules. What do you think about these rules and these rules? I'm like, you know, bottom line is, does it help you achieve in the game what you want to get out of the game? Rules themselves are completely pointless unless they make your play better. And to whatever you think better is, that's what rules need to do. They need to make the play of the game better. Uh, I have very specific ideas, which I've gone through ad nauseum, to exactly how I think rules make a game better. But you talk about the imagination is first. We see that so much in uh, the later edition, say like fourth edition of D&D, but it's not really the case. And I get people that are inculcated into that mindset. They're like, okay, we get three sentences on role-playing, and then tome after tome of just r rules and battle grids and how to place miniatures and the battle mechanics go on and on and on and on to the point where you're sitting there trying to learn this completely unimportant stuff uh, when you haven't even read half of your, your race's entry. You don't know how to play that elf and you don't know how to play that wizard, but damned if you know if you don't know how to move away correctly so you don't get flanked and attack of opportunity. So uh, I see that problem continuous. But I'd like you, to, uh, 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 Nards, to talk a little bit about the imagination first and what we like to call that deep immersive style. And I have people come to me and go, oh, well, why are you trying to make Dungeons & Dragons into a role-playing game? Dungeons & Dragons is basically a board game. It's basically uh, a miniature game. It's basically a combat simulationist aspect of a game. And I say, uh, no, it is not. It's a role-playing game. The origins are role-playing games. Along the way, Dungeons & Dragons has taken some missteps. It's taken some poor turns. But at the core of it, it is a synonym for role-playing games. For me, uh, it has that aspect. So what would you like to say about that, the imagination first? The, the, uh, does the original spirit of Dungeons & Dragons, is it uh, an immersive style game? Or is it uh, just this sort of combat, wading, um, miniature-esque uh, debacle that we see in 4th edition? Well, where is well, let's the talk about the lack of imagination first. Okay. Um, and I'm going to refer to Rob Koontz again. Um, yeah. This Story. Uh, we had a phone conversation a couple of months ago, and he told me the story, which I, my, I think my jaw hit the floor um, pretty clearly. The he was in bar, a bookstore, I think it was Barnes and Noble, uh, a few years back, and uh, this is during third edition uh, or three point five, one or the other. And he was sat uh, near the role playing area, and there was a guy there, and he's like this on the bookshelves, and he there's a, there's a whole array. A Forgotten Realms books in front of him. Every, they're just a massive quantity of Forgotten Realms books. Sure. And the guy just, you know, so Rob looks at him and you say, oh, hey, you know, I, I'm just for you guys who, you know, I don't know, Rob is, you, you, you may not know this, but it, you, I think the entire world owes more to Rob Koontz uh, for role-playing than I think anybody would ever know. Um, so, and so this is what makes a story even more sad and funny at the same time. So Rob says, oh, can't find what you're looking for. And um, the guy says, oh, I, I'm, I'm looking for um, a new book for Forgotten Realms. And, and um, Rob says, oh, you, you, you play uh, Dungeons and Dragons. He says, no, 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 I play Forgotten Realms. So Rob kind of says, oh, okay. Um, can't find what you're looking for, though. He says, no, they haven't released anything for two months. I'm going crazy. And Rob turns around and says, well, why don't you just take a pen out uh, and a pencil or something, get some graph paper or a piece of paper and, and write something, write something of your own. And a guy looked at him and said, do you, do you know anything about role playing? And, <laughs> and, and that shows the sheer dependency that people now have, that they need other people to do their imagining for them. Um, and I think it's a very, very, very sad state of affairs where people are feeling the dependent need that they have to buy every single thing that comes out for something. I'm a collector. I buy rare stuff. I don't complete collections unless I'm genuinely interested in that collection. And I certainly don't need somebody to do my imagining for me. And at the very end of the D&D &D white, uh, white box or brown box, whatever you want to call it, Gary actually says, almost verbatim, why would you want anybody to do your imagining for you? Because the entire game is about imagination. And this was a, at a time where they scoffed at the idea. They laughed at the idea of published modules, of published adventures. They poured scorn on the idea. And they released uh, products uh, like dungeon geomorphs and outdoor geomorphs, which are tiles and maps and grids and things that you could use, and you implanted your ideas using things like Appendix N, which came out in AD&D, &D, uh, which is a, a 
whole list of literary inspiration, and you were supposed to use your knowledge of mythology, of the supernatural, of folklore, uh, of different tales from different times. You were supposed to take your knowledge of fiction, your creative mind, your imagination, and you were supposed to do a little bit of work to make it worthwhile, to give it that little bit of magic, to make it drive. They didn't want to do adventures. When people like We Warriors appeared on the scene and Judges Guild, it was crazy. The only reason TSR got into that market was because they realized it was a lucrative and profitable one. The original idea of it was laughable to them. Um, and you, again, you can see that in that interview that I'm going to video response to this one. Um, so, yeah, the lack of imagination that we see now compared to the actual imagination that we saw then, where the hobby was 100%, 100% about being creative, to now, where it's about pushing out product cycles, renewing the product cycle X amount of years because you sold X amount of books, therefore, holy shit, you know, we need to take out that block now. We can't publish uh, Dragonlance anymore. We can't do Forgotten Realms anymore. We've we published enough books. People aren't buying them. So we need to reboot the rules. And when we reboot the rules, we can then republish all of those settings again for the new rules. And that's all that they're doing. Think about it. You, you, if you have AD&D, if you have od and if you have... Um, let me show you, that's original D&D. This is Holmes D&D, the version that followed thereafter. It came in this box here. I, I still can't find my basic expert D&D. Then you have Mensa D&D, which came out after. And I see so many people refer to this as first edition. It's not. It's nothing like the first edition of Dungeons and Dragons. It's very, very different. Um, so, again, the game has gone through a lot of iterations whereby people have made mistakes. Um, and it, the mistakes have come about purely because they needed to sell more product um, so that they could um, make more money, which any business is going to do. I'm not going to hold that against them. But uh, you know, at the, at the end of the day, they could be quite honest about it and say, guys, we're going to make some money. Buy this if you're interested instead of, oh, we're just going to can absolutely everything and we're going to start again and make you buy it all over again if you want to keep up. Uh, I just think it's a bit dishonest, I think it's a bit disingenuous, and at the, we're a consumerist society, I'm getting a little bit philosophical about society in general, but we are a consumerist society, so we buy things, and the newest thing is always the best thing. Um, you know, the new D&D is better than what? What is it better than? Is it actually better than the original experience that 1974 original Dungeons and Dragons gives me? I don't think so. Well, that that's definitely well said. But back to the question we ask here. Let's talk about let's talk about that, the spirit of Dungeons and Dragons, because that is something we I so often have people uh, that are detractors, they they, they kind of guys, and uh, you guys don't want to really have me describe how I imagine you. I'll tell you that right now to be uh, just a shoot the way I always am. But these sort of people I can only imagine are sort of the pedantic rules lawyers that, that we so oh, oh so do dread uh, the the enemies of creativity at their at its roots. But they always like to say, well, uh, my main man, you're going about it wrong. Trying to make Dungeons Dragons into this role playing game vehicle that you imagine of being able to bring that immersive style, being able to get deep into character, acting things out, uh, talking in character. Uh, bringing uh, the world to life, making it breathe. Uh, their general, uh, my best summation of their general points, and I'm sure I'm going to make this uh, wrong, and I'm cramming a lot of different people into into one pe one idea here, but it seems to be that the spirit that now is of Wizards of Coast Dungeons and Dragons is the correct spirit of Dungeons and Dragons. So where do you think we fall on there in terms of what I'm talking about? My, my uh, position of immersive, and I'm sure you and you under, and I think the audience mostly understands, is that the spirit of Dungeons and Dragons, or is the spirit of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, oh, my guy moves over here, hey, can you do this for me, you know, it's out of character, out of combat, uh, out, out of game, metagame, it's uh, uh, miniature movement, it's not engaging, it's engaging in sort of a board game approach, instead of engaging the imagination, where, where do you think the truth of the actual spirit, let's try to nail down the spirit as best you can of the intended Dungeons Dragons, where do you think it lies along the lines of outline there? The original spirit, uh, the original spirit of the game was about experimentation, about creativity, and having a, an immersive experience around the table while you did things, while you explored things, while you used your mind to do things. Like people slate Team of Horrors as being the ultimate death fest. Well, do you know what? 
several characters back in the playtest survived the Tomb of Horrors because they were creative, because they thought about things, because they were there in that environment checking things out. They were role-playing. They weren't doing perception checks. They were role-playing what they were touching, what they were feeling. What can I smell from down there? Mm. And it was a back and forth. It was a two-way dialogue. It was actually very dice light. Very, very dice light. It was all about the communication. It was all about what are you doing? What is in this environment? If you missed a visual clue or an audible clue or some sort of sensory anything, that might be what killed your character. Um, and I think that the original games, people go, oh, but they were death fests. Uh, I hear that a lot from the modern gamers. No, they weren't. They, you died if you did something stupid, um, if you didn't pay attention, if you weren't actually having the dialogue. If you're somebody who walks in and goes, I roll my perception check, and that's the first thing you do without the games master saying, make the perception check. If you just assume that that's what you have to do, that's not an immersive experience. That is not in keeping with the original spirit of the game. So the original spirit, how do I encapsulate it because I am rambling a little bit, the immersion was in your character's actions. It was, I can't really say so much about the character's personality. I think that was maybe a little bit more of development. You kind of did play a role, but it wouldn't be as refined as it is in, say, something like Vampire and uh, that kind of game. That came later. Um, but yes, you did role play your character. Uh, but the immersion was very much in the environment, it was in the world, it was, it was what was around you, it was your interaction, but the, I think the, where it didn't have the full impact was where somebody would literally take on the absolute full personality of the individual. Uh, that kind of immersion still wasn't there at that time, okay, so that did come later. However, I don't see that as a bad thing, everything changes. Sometimes evolution is not good evolution, uh, I will say that, and I think that D&D has gone through some very, very poor uh, iterations and evolutions, um, some of it for business reasons, some of it for creative reasons, they just wanted to change things up a little bit, and it maybe didn't work as well as it could have done, and it did take away from uh, the original ideas. Uh, so, this, yeah, to answer your question as much as possible, uh, some things were still lacking back in the day, but actually had they had the experience back in the day, uh, I'm sure uh, from the conversations I've had, it would have been played as a 100% absolute immersive experience. Well, you have it there, folks, and I think that Martin's come on. Uh, Martin, uh, for those of you who are unaware of him, he is, I believe by all accounts, the resident historian on Dungeons and Dragons. He has delved into the in early editions. He's pulled them up and literally shown them to you. You can at least uh, perhaps guess that he's read them, that he knows how to read, that he's experienced them, that he's played them, that he understands them to some degree. Perhaps you aren't willing to buy that, but I, I, I am. And he's an individual that, that knows this stuff very well. He's spoken with individuals who were there. We could see that in an interview on his channel. He's going to respond it here. So you don't have to take our word for that. You can literally watch that. And I suggest that you do. Even if you do believe, <laughs> have a look at it. It was a wonderful interview. Uh, I, I went through the whole thing. I, know, I watched part of it a second time. And then uh, just like uh, uh, Rob says, uh, not based on chain mail. And I bring him on here essentially because I'm very tired of hearing that from people who quite frankly don't know what they're talking about. So that, that original experience, you know, and that's exactly what he's saying. Like before... You know, we're 40 years after that, you know. Uh, they didn't have 40 years to, to refine, refine, refine. So, of course, the approach and aspect that I talk about today is quite honestly going to yield a more refined, a better version of a game. But they're groping in the dark, and they're doing that in this, in this wonderful, exploratory, immersive aspect. And that was the beauty of Dungeons & Dragons. That's what I try to put over in each of these videos where I slam out against the things that I think are damaging that Dungeons & Dragons experience, damaging the hobby, and uh, I'm never one to go along with anything that hurts our hobby. Uh, I love our hobby. I know Martin loves our hobby, and we want to see those who are custodians of our hobby treating it seriously and not attempting to uh, subvert for their own, own gains. Uh, you know, the, I like to use the old rape-my-girlfriend analogy. So... Uh, 
when when we see that, and we see that uh, in coherent thought line rambling, the Dungeons and Dragons was a miniature game, as if people thought that O D and D box set he has there came with a bag of beholders and kobolds and and, and zombie skeletons. It didn't. That's not how it was made. Maybe you had like a miniature to represent your character. Maybe very few people did. I never ever saw any of that, and I played a lot of D and D, original D and D, a little bit, uh, and a ton of A D and D. Before we we had 3.0, when that stuff started coming in, it was a model for Wizards of the Coast. It's not the spirit of Dungeons and Dragons, people. And uh, you have it here from Martin. You have it here from me. If you choose to believe something else, that's on you. And that is a fact, a jack to you. Martin, i definitely like to thank you for being here. Check out Grognard Games. It's in, The link is in, in my comments. He's going to video response video here. All you do is go and you hit subscribe on him and you watch all his videos, every single one of them. Great. Hit the like button for him. He does a wonderful job. And uh, he doesn't put out as many videos as he should, but there are videos there, and if you haven't seen them, they're new to you, so watch them. Uh, in summation and closing, Martin, is there any other uh, rumors you'd like to dispel along those lines or any other uh, bits of information or wisdom you'd like to share here with the Barbarian Horde? The Barbarian Horde. That's uh, right, my friend. We okay, roll almost 4,000 deep. There is one thing that uh, I would very, very much like to share with everybody, um, and that is that... And I discussed this with Andrew a little bit earlier. A lot of people are taking the game, or they're taking what they want to do, and they go, okay, here's a, here's a piece of fantasy. I love that piece of fantasy, so I'm going to base this piece of fantasy. I'm going to base my fantasy on that fantasy. Mm. And then they go, I want to base this fantasy on this fantasy. And then somebody else comes along and they base this fantasy on this fantasy. And from the source down here somewhere, it becomes very watered down as we go. And we only have to look at the original myth, uh, myths of the vampire, um, and we, we go through the original Slavic myth, the Lamia, uh, the Egyptian myths, uh, Andrew and me spoke about a little bit earlier, actually, before we came on with this. And then you look at Twilight, um, and you can see how basing a fantasy on a fantasy on a fantasy on a fantasy really, really dilutes everything. And what I'd encourage everybody to do is exactly what Gary Gygax was doing all the way through uh, his playtest experience when he's creating D&D. Now, he had, on his bookshelves, like these behind me, uh, shelves of the Encyclopedia Britannica 1918 edition. It was the last edition to have these very, very long discourses in them, sometimes 100 pages long. Uh, and what Gary would do is go to his shelves, he would pull off the encyclopedia, he would flip through until he found something that was very interesting, quite unique. And he would then build using his influences and his experience on that idea in that encyclopedia. So he would take real world events, real locations, real places. He then mixed them with a little bit of fantasy from, say, Michael Moorcock or Tolkien. And then he would add his own little bit of Gygaxian magic. And hey, presto, he had a game. It took him about 30 minutes of time. It was That was his game prep. 30-something minutes. Uh, and always with a foundation in reality that his players could... Uh, get immersed in, that they understood, because the closer it is to reality, the more immersive it is. And it's interesting that uh, I had a, uh, another chat. I refer to Rob Coons quite a bit during this, and I apologize for that, but he, as I said, he's one of the only living people left um, that was there at the HS table. And um, he actually said to me that um, Vampire, Vampire the Masquerade, was the closest thing he'd seen for about 15, 20 years. Uh, to the original spirit of the original version of Dungeons & Dragons with the immersion, with everything else, and the encouragement to sandbox and do whatever you wanted to do and play as a character. And he said that was kind of almost like a, almost a kind of a missing element in some respects, but not every, uh, to the original version. And he wished that they could have evolved it to that level. Um, and that's the first game that impressed him for a very, very, very long time. And uh, I kind of agree with that. I'm not a vampire fan. Uh, I don't play World of Darkness. But you don't have to be a fan, and you don't have to play these games to not read them and enjoy them and understand the quality of something. Uh, and I do see it as a very high-quality immersive experience and uh, one that is actually very, very close to the original immersive experience that was in the original games. Um, so in closing, really... Don't believe the myths, because uh, they are myths. And if you are an RPG writer, please, for God's sake, don't think of some war game rules and then try and tack on an experience on top of it. Do it the other way around. Make your experience, then put the rules in, 
to reflect the experience. And there is no other way to do it, otherwise you don't end up with a solid, cohesive game that is slick and lends itself to everybody enjoying themselves around the table. And that's all I really have to say, and I just want to say thank you for watching, and Ander, thank you for having me on uh, again, and uh, for calling you Nards several Nard. times. <laughs> Nards is your name. You are the Nards. You're the man with the balls to bring it and drop the Nards right in the mouth of the non-believers over and over again like that old English tea. Uh, absolutely, and I agree with you. For those aspiring RPG writers out there, and you hit me up constantly, uh, how do I do this and this make this minor system? And I'm going to have elves. No, create an idea, figure out how you want your game to flow, and then build a system of mechanics that facilitate your flow, that facilitate your world. I did not use the when writing within the Ring of Fire, which is getting close. Um, I did not use Dungeons and Dragons books as my basis. I used this is a tiny stack of the books that I read and used. To base on the game, you know, classical mythology of all types. Yeah, old, old good stuff. And I'd sit there and read it to my son, or read stuff to myself if it's more mature. Books on different monsters from all over the world to bring different flavors. If you remember these classics, uh, which I had as a kid and share with my son, but at the same time, they bring that 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 flavor and style over. Uh, plumbing through all sorts of videos and, and footage of different styles of different ancient worlds of different mythological cycles of Native American, of African, of Eastern European, of Celtic, of Norse, of, of Greco-Roman, of Sumerian, of Aztec, of Indian, of Japanese, and bringing and blending those styles and taking and picking out what pieces you want to do. And that was the experience. Not Don't just grab D&D elves and dwarves and go, eh, well, I have a terrible rule set to go with D&D. And so many new indie games are a terrible rule set of D&D. Pathfinder. And when you have um, that sort of experience, you didn't write a game. You just committed something that you would get expelled from a university for doing. So uh, I love what you're saying there. And you put it so much succinctly more than my ramblings and babblings and barbarizings. But uh, absolutely. And again, always my man Nards. I always will bring you back again time after time. And I love your channel. And I appreciate you being here. So uh, thank you for everyone watching. I thank you for everyone. Who, who wants to believe in that experience of immersive gaming and having the best game that you can out of the tools that you possess as a human being. Thank you. Boom!